Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to CDE Virtual. We're extremely fortunate to have Frank Fukuyama with us again. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for doing this. We last talked in March 2021, a rather different world. It's three months since Russia's unprovoked invasion of its neighbor, and the war continues to tear through Ukraine with enormous implications for that country and around the world. It's a privilege to talk about the implications of this almost unbelievable war with you, Frank. Thanks again for your time and to agreeing to be with CDE again. I presume uh, you're in Stanford, California. Yes, that's right. Uh, thanks very much, Anne, for having me back. And uh, it's really a delight to be able to talk to a CDD, CDE audience again. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump right in. You have a special relationship with Ukraine and many of its democratic leaders and up and coming leaders. Why is that? Why did you think it was so important to get involved in Ukraine long before the war? Well, uh, so I'm uh, the former director of something called the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Uh, we are a center that's dedicated to research uh, about comparative democratic institutions in countries around the world. But we also have a practitioner side because we run a number of training programs uh, for, you know, usually mid-career up and coming leaders that will take an important role in building democracy in their countries. We've had quite a number of South Africans that have come through our Draper Hills Summer Fellows Program, for example. And uh, we have something called the Leadership Academy for Development that's actually done a couple of courses uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, beginning in 2014, after the Russian uh, takeover of Crimea and intervention in the Donbass, uh, we began to feel that Ukraine had actually become the a front line in a global struggle for democracy. Uh, Russia was busy positioning itself as the leading illiberal power uh, in the world and was using, you know, conventional military power to extend its, uh, uh, its, its sway in the region. They had intervened not just in Ukraine, but in Georgia, in Moldova, in, you know, several other places uh, on its periphery. Uh, and so we thought it was important to uh, help Ukraine build its internal democratic institutions. Ukraine has long struggled with issues of systemic corruption, uh, poor governance. Uh, it's actually doing a lot better than many people realize. But uh, over the years, we uh, did a number of training programs for uh, young Ukrainians. And among other things, it really convinced me that Ukraine would solve these problems because there is a, uh, you know, a whole generation of younger Ukrainians that basically wanted to be Europeans. They didn't want to get sucked into this uh, corrupt um, authoritarian Russian political system that was really the other alternative in that country. So for that reason, I traveled to Ukraine quite a few times in the eight years since uh, 2014. And then, um, you know, we've had I don't know, perhaps 300 people go through these different uh, training programs of ours. So I have a lot of friends there and, and you know, I feel a big personal stake in the outcome of this conflict. Did you see the war coming? Um... Well, I don't think anybody really foresaw uh, the scale of the war that would happen. Uh, of course, the US, uh, uh, intelligence community actually predicted exactly what happened, which is, uh, you know, an attempt to attack the whole of Ukraine uh, and seize the capital. Uh, I actually, and, and I think most other observers didn't really expect uh, an invasion of that scale. Uh, you know, what I had thought was that the Russians would uh, try a, a, a a more limited policy that would also be effective, which was the economic strangulation uh, of Ukraine by blocking exports out of the uh, 
Black Sea ports and, and that sort of thing. So I was actually surprised when, you know, they went after Kiev, the capital, the country's capital in, in the first instance. Hmm. Now, as you know, Putin has argued that liberalism is obsolete and that it's not for the Russian people, but he has a democratic or an emerging democratic Ukraine on his border, which is culturally very similar and they're moving in a more liberal direction as are other countries formerly part of the Soviet empire. So what is the war really about in your view? What is, what is going on? Well, um, this was uh, the source of a lot of debate before the war began because there are a number of people that thought that it really was about uh, what Putin says it was about, which was national security, that NATO had been expanded uh, after 1991, after the breakup of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and in 2008, uh, at the uh, Bucharest NATO summit, there was a, uh, a commitment to at least consider the membership of both Georgia and Ukraine uh, in NATO. And Putin has relentlessly said that this represented a security threat to Russia, uh, that it was intolerable. And uh, this was his excuse for, you know, the actions that he took against both. I mean, people forget, but Russia also invaded uh, 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 Georgia, you know, in that year. Uh, they had these two breakaway republics uh, of uh, and South Ossetia and, and uh, uh, they sent Russian troops, you know, right uh, close to the uh, capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, uh, in that year. Uh, I think that um, this security uh, argument is just an excuse on Russia's part, because even in 2008, uh, the Bush administration, though it said that Georgia and Ukraine could start the succession process, never followed up on it. And in the uh, succeeding, um, you know, 14 years, uh, nobody in NATO really made an effort to actually get these countries in. I think everybody realized that, you know, Ukraine was a very divided country. It wasn't clear what kind of consensus there was behind joining NATO. Uh, and I think nobody wanted to put themselves in a position of actually directly having to fight Russia. This became especially true after the Russian invasion when there was an active war going on in eastern Ukraine. Um, I think that the real motive for the war was rather different. I do think that Ukraine represents a threat to Russia, not a security threat. Uh, you know, these ridiculous charges that Ukraine was going to commit genocide against Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. I mean, that was just uh, that was always just a pretext. The model that Ukraine represented was the real threat, I think, that Putin felt to his regime, not to Russia, the country Russia, but to his assertion that, you know, Slavic peoples somehow inevitably had to be governed by a centralized uh, strongman uh, dictatorship like the one that he was running. Ukraine has actually held, you know, incredibly free and fair democratic elections. Uh, the election of Vladimir uh, Zelensky was a great example of that because he was a total outsider. As I think people are, are aware, you know, he was a comedian who starred in a TV show called Servant of the People, in which you know the main plot was, uh, you know, this ordinary guy just somehow gets elected president of Ukraine, and sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, and at that election, something like two thirds of all the sitting parliamentarians were thrown out of their offices because of a kind of general disgust of Ukrainian voters for the sort of, you know, corrupt elites that had been running Ukraine up to that point. That didn't solve the problem, but it indicates that there was genuine um, uh, uh, democratic choice going on there. The other thing about Ukraine is that it really is basically a free country. You know, essentially anyone can say anything uh, critical of the government, critical of corruption, critical of the oligarchs that, you know, had unfortunately too much sway in that country uh, compared to Russia, where, you know, really, if you say anything, neg in fact, if you even call what's going on right now a war in Russia, that's been criminalized and 
you know, journalists uh, and ordinary people have been sent to jail for simply speaking those words. Uh, and by contrast, you know, Ukraine was uh, a, a genuinely free country that could exercise democratic choice. And I think that that's really the threat that, that Putin's regime uh, felt from it. The other thing about motives, uh, I think, is sitting there in plain sight. Putin uh, wrote a long article last summer in which he basically said that the Russian and Ukrainian peoples are one. He gave another long speech just on the eve of the war back in February in which he laid out this case that Ukraine was this artificial creation, that it really wasn't a country, that it was really part of Russia, and that um, you know he saw his historical role a little bit like Catherine the Great, that was the one that annexed Crimea in the first place, or Peter the Great, that was reassembling, you know, the great Russian people. Uh, and this is something, you know, this is an assertion that went completely contrary to the opinions of people that actually lived in Ukraine, who uh, I think, unbeknownst to Putin, had really developed a, a, a clear national identity that was very different from the Russian national identity. It's true that culturally, uh, Ukrainians and Russians are very similar. A lot of Ukrainians, I, I would say actually most Ukrainians speak Russian. Uh, the food is similar. A lot of the cultural traditions, you know, the orthodoxy in both countries are, is similar, but they have a distinct national identity, partly built around uh, a Ukrainian language and separate Ukrainian traditions, but I think mostly having to do with, you know, their desire to live in a basically free country. Uh, so their version of culture, you know, includes, I think, those political institutions that um, uh, make uh, uh, Ukraine uh, a liberal democracy. So that was the real issue. It, it wasn't a security threat. It was this kind of political cultural threat that uh, Putin saw and his desire to basically enlarge Russia and add the 40 million people living in Ukraine to, you know, Russia's 140 million. Hmm. Um, I want to ask you some more, but I'll come to that in a minute about Russia. Um, in early March this year, you surprised, well, a lot of people by saying that Russia is heading for outright defeat in Ukraine. And in late April, you doubled down on this view, saying that Ukraine will succeed in driving the Russians out of the territories they now hold. Why were you so convinced about Russian defeat then? And what is your view now at the end of May? Well, uh, the reason that I was optimistic about what Ukraine would achieve militarily is just by following um, the course of the war uh, you know, the morale difference between the Ukrainians and the Russians was incredible. You know, tens of thousands, uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Russians have left Russia since the beginning of the war. They don't want to serve in the military. They don't want to be associated with Putin's regime, uh, uh, especially uh, younger ones. Uh, whereas a quarter million Ukrainians that were living in other parts of Europe came back to Ukraine after the war began in order to, you know, fight on their country's behalf. Um, we've seen these incredible problems in the Russian military. Uh, you know, the equipment was not well maintained because a lot of the maintenance money had been skimmed off in uh, corruption. The soldiers that were captured early on in the war said that they thought they were just going on an exercise. They didn't know they were invading uh, a neighboring country. Uh, there was very poor leadership. Uh, the overall strategic plan was really crazy because it was premised on an assumption that Ukraine wanted to be liberated uh, and, and to join Russia voluntarily. And they got to Ukraine and discovered that the Ukrainians really wanted to you know, remain Ukraine and were fighting very tenaciously. And so they were completely surprised that there were no collaborators or uh, people willing to come over uh, to their side. Uh, and you know, the other thing simply had to do with you know, military strategy that uh, the Russians uh, planned this war very poorly in a system that reflects their own authoritarian form of government. Uh, 
And so everything is directed from the top, from Moscow. There's very little initiative by lower level uh, commanders. Uh, you know, something like 10 to 12 Russian generals, uh, senior naval officers have been killed in this war. And partly it's because the lower ranks of the Russian military are very poor. Uh, and you have to send these very senior uh, uh, officers to the front in order to direct, you know, operations that should be led by sergeants and first lieutenants and, uh, and this sort of thing. Whereas the Ukrainian side uh, has been receiving training from NATO uh, over the last few years and operates in a much more decentralized uh, manner. So all of these put together, uh, it seemed to me, made it pretty clear that Russia, despite the paper advantage they had and numbers of troops and tanks and so forth uh, was really not likely to do that well. And, you know, I think the Ukrainians proved that true. Uh, they drove them out of the area uh, around Kyiv. Uh, they had to retreat back over the Russian border and they've more recently pushed them out of the area near Kharkiv, their uh, Ukraine's second city. Uh, right now, it's not clear what's going to happen. The war has kind of slowed down <clears throat> over the last week. The Russians have finally uh, begun concentrating forces in a very narrow front in the Donbass, and they're, they're ensconcing themselves in the south of Ukraine, where they're hoping to be able to cut Ukraine off from uh, access to the, uh, to the Black Sea. Um, and at this point, you know, I don't know. I think that I think that Russia is has been weakened. You know, there are estimates that something like a third of the massive invasion force that they had collected on the eve of the war has now basically been destroyed. They've lost, you know, three thousand armored vehicles, which is just an wow. unbelievable number. The numbers of casualties, uh, dead and wounded, are probably fifty, sixty thousand. And so, you know, they, they've suffered really horrendously so far. Um, the, the thing that we don't know is what the losses have been on the Ukrainian side. Zelensky this mm. past week suggested they're losing 50 to 100 soldiers each day, which is a very high number as well. Uh, and right now, you know, we don't know whether they're preparing to go back on the offensive or whether uh, this war is going to degenerate into a kind of you know, World War One style trench warfare where both sides really can't make significant gains against uh, the other. So, you know, I may be wrong in the prediction that Ukraine will succeed in driving the Russians out of those territories they occupied in mm. in the south. But, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see about that. Hmm. How seriously do you take Putin's threat? to use chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons. There are people who are saying the more he's, you know, the more that things fail, the more likely he is to do something completely unexpected and terrible. Well, Putin himself has not directly made that threat. He's just talked about his nuclear arsenal, kind of reminding people that that's what makes Russia a great power. The people that have been talking about it are these talking heads on Russian state TV who have been just totally irresponsible. You know, there's been a, 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 a real norm, an international norm about not threatening uh, to hit populations with nuclear weapons. And yet, you know, these talking heads in Russia are talking about nuking Paris and London and, <coughs> excuse me, targets in the United States, which is, first of all, just absurd. I mean, Nobody, nobody is going to do anything like that. But it's also extremely irresponsible because it's kind of normalizing the use of nuclear weapons against big population centers, which is something that the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, carefully avoided. You know, they would never talk about this kind of thing. And yet this kind of rhetoric is coming from Russia. But I think that the likelihood that Russia will actually use weapons of mass destruction is still uh, low. I, you know, nobody can ignore this threat. Uh, you know, it would just be completely irresponsible given the consequences. But, you know, the Russians have not made any concrete moves to actually uh, operationalize the threat. They haven't put their nuclear forces on higher states of alert or, 
you know, pulled the, the missiles out of their storage uh, facilities, you know, the things that they would do if they're actually preparing to do something like that. The other issue is that, you know, as a military matter, it's not clear that this is going to help them all that much. Um, mm. And it will almost certainly uh, escalate things to, you know, a point where NATO would be likely to join the war directly. You know, right now, NATO is providing weapons, but not a single soldier, you know, has crossed over the border into Ukraine. Uh, and if the Russians escalate to weapons of mass destruction, you know, NATO has a lot of options short of responding in kind uh, that would be very bad for the Russians. So that's why I think that that threat is probably not um, as great as some people are thinking. Hmm. I was interested to read, I think it was Mitt Romney in the New York Times this week, talking about how to respond, that if there were a nuclear strike of some kind, that doesn't mean that the West has to respond with a nuclear missile as well. What, what is your view on all of that? This is very foreign. Well, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's true. I think uh, NATO has a lot of things that they can do short of responding with a nuclear weapon. For example, NATO has been unwilling to um, implement a no-fly zone over Ukrainian territory. I think that was a wise decision because just as an operational matter, in order to have a no-fly zone against a, a country like Russia, you'd have to preemptively attack air defense sites, Russian air defense sites, both in Ukraine and over the border in Russia oh. itself. And that is an act of escalation that I think uh, really, uh, it's correct that the Biden administration and European leaders you know, refuse to take. But if the Russians actually use a nuclear weapon, I think those kinds of options are then on the table. Uh, uh, so there's a lot that could be done. In, and by the way, if NATO decided to impose a no-fly zone, they could really do it. I mean, they could basically clear the skies of you know, uh, Russian uh, aircraft and rockets and so forth. Uh, so you know, there are things that can be done uh, to escalate on the NATO side in response to you know, this kind of a Russian escalation. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think the war tells us about Putin and Russia today? You started hinting at that. And so that's the first question. And then the second is, what happens if he's defeated, whatever we mean by defeated? Can he survive? So does he have to be defeated totally or perhaps just pushed back to the, the east, as you suggested? So what happens in Russia as a result of this amazing invasion by Putin? Well, uh, just to answer your last question, of course, nobody knows. Uh, you know, there are always uh, rumors about, well, first of all, Putin will never be unseated, I think, as a result of a color revolution or spontaneous demonstrations against him. And from what we can tell from, you know, the limited polling that goes on inside Russia, his invasion has gotten, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of nationalistic support from the Russian people. Uh, if there's a threat, it would have to come from within the security services, you know, within the military, within the FSB, their domestic intelligence service, or other uh, so-called power ministries that would decide that Putin had become a big liability and gotten the country into a, you know, a lot of trouble because of the economic sanctions and, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, what the war says about Russia uh, is that, you know, in many ways, Russia is still living in the 19th century. Uh, it's still a colonial power. You know, what happened in 1991 is that all the Union republics within the former Soviet Union were given a chance to decide on whether to stay with the Soviet Union or become independent countries. And they all overwhelmingly decided to become independent. Uh, including Ukraine that voted very decisively for independence at that point. And, you know, unfortunately, there's something about the way that Russian national identity has developed that uh, makes many Russians feel that they can't be authentically Russian if they don't dominate, you know, the weaker countries on their periphery. Uh, and so I think that that's really been the basis for, 
you know, a lot of Russian foreign policy since uh, 1991. Putin himself said that, you know, the, the collapse of the former Soviet Union was greatest tragedy of the 20, 20th century. Uh, and that expresses, I think, the feeling on the part of a lot of Russians that they deserve to be this big empire and have these, in effect, colonial uh, possessions, uh, because, you know, that's what it means to be Russian. Hmm. So we just don't know, if, and I suppose it might be too soon to tell, if there's any way of uh, getting rid of Putin from within. Uh, well, just yeah, I mean, at this point, it would have to be a conspiracy like the one that, yeah. you know, unseated Nikita Khrushchev uh, in 1964. And you wouldn't hear about it until after it happened, because that's <laughs> yeah. the way conspiracies, you know, happen. Wow. Wow. Um, so there are lots of people, most importantly in Russia and China, who argued before this war that the West was in decline that democracies will not fight for their values anymore, that the West will not defend a liberal rules-based order or international system. But in many ways, the reaction to Russia's invasion and the resulting devastation has seemed to demonstrate a strengthening of the West, certainly of NATO and of values in critical Western countries. How do you see this? How important has this been? Will it last? So um, it's been really remarkable, the kind of NATO unity that we've seen as a result of the invasion. I mean, part of that is simply how gross the violation of, you know, Ukraine's sovereignty was. Uh, this, is, um, this is not one of those conflicts in which they're kind of complex, balanced, nuanced, you know, rights and wrongs on both sides. I mean, it was such a naked aggression that it really shocked many uh, people in uh, NATO countries uh, who were also, you know, subject to Russian power and threatened by it to realize that uh, this really was a, you know, a big threat to, to them in general. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the most uh, remarkable change was the one that happened in Germany where uh, Olaf Scholz, the new chancellor, announced a doubling of the German defense budget and really the ending of a 40-year period of Ostpolitik, where you know, the Germans felt that they had a special obligation to open bridges to Russia and to try to include it in a larger European uh, security framework that included a heavy degree of economic uh, interdependence. And so, you know, it was the former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder that was one of the chief lobbyists in favor of Nord Stream 2 that would have doubled the amount of Russian national uh, natural gas coming into Germany uh, and therefore doubled the dependence of Germany on, on Russia. And all that has been swept away by the, uh, by the war. You know, virtually every NATO country has now stepped up to the plate in terms of delivering weapons, supplies, uh, including the Germans, which, you know, took some uh, some hard swallowing on their part, but, you know, they've now uh, agreed to do that. Uh, so the initial response was, you know, was quite impressive. Um, will that unity last? I think we're already seeing cracks uh, in it. Uh, you know, President Macron has begun to, you know, he kind of represents this older view that was temporarily eclipsed that Europe had to have a, you know, security framework that included Russia in some way and has already been talking about, you know, the need for a ceasefire. Um, you know, even in the United States, uh, there is a editorial in the New York Times that said that because of the stalemated war, uh, you know, Ukraine may have to make some concessions in order to get to a peace agreement, the Italians. Uh, seem to buy in on this. And I think that really what's going to happen will depend on the military developments that will take place in the next yeah. few weeks. If the war does look like it's bogging down into a very bloody and costly stalemate, then I think this unity that we've seen within NATO is going to start to fracture and more people will say, well, yeah, NATO really does have to make concessions in order to get to a ceasefire. Um, if the Ukrainians regain the momentum and start pushing uh, 
the Russians out of places that they occupied after February 24th, then I think those calls will be muted and, you know, there'll be more continuing consensus on the need to, you know, to arm Ukraine to the point where they can actually recover those territories. So we'll have to see which of these, uh, which of these develops. But the main point is that kind of uh, immediate NATO unity that we saw in the early days is not likely to, uh, you know, persist and we'll see some of the old divisions reappear. Hmm. How much has, you know, I mean, the German sort of change of policy has been quite remarkable. I have read in a number of places that they're talking big about the arms that they will send to Ukraine, but actually actual delivery is a lot less and they're contributing a lot less than much smaller countries closer to the conflict. Do you have any feel of that? Or... Well, that's, yeah, that's all true. I, I think yeah. there's still a lot of resistance, especially in the left wing of the uh, of the Social Democratic Party that, you know, a lot of whom still, you know, are clinging to this older idea that they have to accommodate Russia and kind of bring it into the European family of nations and so forth. Uh, so they they've been slower to, you know, make these weapons deliveries than than other countries. Um, but, you know, they've nonetheless been doing it. Uh, you know, I think it's better late than never. So um, uh, I think that they are, you know, in the end going to step up to the plate. The trouble is, you know, we don't know whether that's going to be soon enough to really affect the outcome, because as I said, you know, the war is really going to be decided in the next few weeks. And, uh, you know, the, right now the Ukrainians especially need longer range artillery of the sort that um, they've been getting some of it, but, you know, there are other systems that they could be getting that, you uh, are not being delivered. And so that's really the, mm. the struggle that's going on right now. What do you think of how the US president uh, Biden has responded? Have you been impressed? Has it been strong enough? What's your view on the US? Yeah, I think that Biden has actually done a pretty good job. You know, obviously the withdrawal from Afghanistan, although I think the underlying decision was the right one, uh, really looked pretty bad. Uh, because of the chaos and the collapse of the Afghan government that seemed to be unanticipated by uh, anyone in, in Washington, although it could have been. Um, but, you know, I think that he gets high marks for the way he's handled Ukraine. Uh, they have not, they've given Ukraine support, but they have not, you know, taken escalatory steps that they could have, because I think they're still cautious about you know, the, the possibility of escalation and direct war uh, between the US and Russia or NATO and Russia. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing that is probably the most impressive is something that's less visible. Uh, I don't think that the Europeans would have come together in this uh, united front had it not been for a lot of legwork by American diplomats before the war started. So for example, they made a big effort to try to increase LNG exports from the Middle East and from the United States itself to Europe uh, to replace an anticipated, you know, cutoff of natural gas from Russia. You know, that's really the issue that's being fought out in Europe right now is whether, you know, because every day that goes by, the Russians get something like $700 million in payments for energy supplies that they're providing to, uh, to Europe. And so it's really what's keeping their war machine going. But the Europeans, you know, are very dependent on this Russian gas. And so there's uh, the scramble now to try to reduce that supply or reduce that dependence. But, you know, it, it, the supply needs to come from somewhere. So the Americans started this process of finding alternative uh, sources. You know, the United States itself has be become a big exporter uh, of natural gas in recent years. A lot of it was going to Asia. And so some of that was redirected to Europe. And so this sort of thing has been happening, I think, in the background and it's not that visible, but um, uh, it's, it's important. The one area I would say that there has not been sufficient attention to is the, the question of exporting uh, agricultural commodities mm. uh, from Ukraine. So, 
Russia and then Ukraine were the, you know, the biggest and second biggest uh, wheat exporters uh, uh, prior to the war. Uh, and the Russians have deliberately blockaded uh, Ukraine's ability to ship uh, all this uh, food out. And as I'm sure you're very aware, in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in uh, South Asia, people are really dependent on these uh, grain exports. And so bread prices you know, throughout the Middle East, for example, have uh, skyrocketed. They were already high because of supply chain disruptions due to COVID and you know, the, the economic disruption we've seen in the last couple of years. But this blockade of exports from uh, uh, Ukraine has been very, very serious. Uh, I think that there's a good case to be made for a lot of external help to reopen those uh, those exports. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think it would be done for, you know, basically humanitarian purposes. It's not just Ukraine that has all this grain sitting in silos, you know, unused uh, that it's losing money on, but, you know, the people that or the consumers of this are not having access to uh, to the grain. And I would think that there'd be a strong case to be made for a UN effort to reopen those shipping channels. Um, you know, it involves uh, innocent passage of commercial vessels on international waters. And um, I think that, you know, that's something that the international community really ought to uh, apply a lot of uh, effort uh, to, you know, in, in order to reopen those channels. Yeah, um, it seems negotiations are starting around that. But let, let me move to a different question. You've said that a sort of wider implication that the invasion by Russia has already done huge damage to the world's autocrats and right-wing populists. Can you talk a bit about why you've said that and how you think this is playing out from America to Hungary and far beyond? Yeah, well... Um... Putin is, is at the center of an international uh, network of populist nationalists. Uh, so that includes, you know, people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour, you know, these right wing uh, populists in France. Donald Trump is a big fan uh, of his uh, uh, and the like. Uh, and I think that, you know, the reason for this is that there is a deeper connection between Putin and the populist, you know, if you listen to what Donald Trump said about Putin at the beginning of the war, uh, he called Putin brilliant. Uh, he said, you know, he just ordered the independence of these two territories in Ukraine and, and nobody could stop him. Uh, I wish I could do something like that on our southern border. Uh, and so there's this uh, aspiration to a kind of untrammeled strongman authority that I think is common to populists around the world. You know, they're democratically elected, but they don't want to be limited by courts, by legislatures, by the press, you know, by critics. And Putin has all of those things. He can he can act, you know, without those kinds of limits. And for that reason, I think a lot of the populists have gravitated to him. Uh, so if he is perceived as having used that strongman power to land his nation in a huge fiasco, which I think he already has given the military failures and the economic sanctions that have been placed on Russia. That model of untrammeled dictatorship, uh, you know, is going to seem a lot less uh, attractive. The other thing that people I think should pay attention to is what's happening on the other side of the world uh, in China, where you know, the Chinese uh, government is pursuing what I think is a kind of insane zero COVID policy. Uh, you know, they've had the city of Shanghai locked down now, 25 million people for several weeks. Uh, and the lockdown is particularly, you know, damaging and cruel. It's separating children from their parents. You know, people can't get medical attention, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, you know, it all seems to be the result of a similar problem to the one in Russia, where you have a single leader at the top that's operating without a whole lot of checks and balances. Uh, and therefore, you know, it, it would say, you know, I have no particular insight into Xi Jinping's thought processes, but it would seem that, 
he's committed himself to the zero COVID strategy. And, you know, it would be a kind of humiliating climb down if he had to admit, you know, the way that Australia or New Zealand have admitted that it's not working and therefore they got to try something else. And so as a result, you have these enormous lockdowns that are coming at a great price to the Chinese economy. So, you know, there are, the authoritarians have been arguing that there are a lot of democratic failures uh, in recent years, and I think that's unfortunately true, but you also get authoritarian failures. And I think that, you know, perceptions about which kind of political system uh, is more reliable uh, in the long run, I think may shift uh, as a result of, you know, these recent uh, developments. Hmm. One can only hope. I read, I think it was in The Economist that we'd all been focusing on Shanghai and the, lock, the extreme lockdown in Shanghai, but actually there was something like 300 million and more people who were being locked down in similar fashion in other cities that we don't know about. Uh, so yeah, I think it's much broader right. than Shanghai and it's, well, it's failing and it's kind of horrific. Um, can, can we talk a bit more about China? Clearly, you know, the Russian invasion, one's worst nightmare was that the Chinese would take this moment to invade Taiwan. Um, so what do you think the lessons China might be talking about from the Russian invasion so far? And then, what? Are, well, I'll come to Taiwan in a moment, but what sort of well, yeah, it's for China? So um, one observation just to begin is that the Chinese are a lot smarter than the Russians <laughs> and they're much more cautious. You know, uh, the thing about Putin is that he is a big risk taker uh, I actually wrote my doctoral dissertation on Soviet policy in the Middle East, and the bottom line of my thesis was that the Russians would threaten to intervene in these different Middle Eastern conflicts, but they never actually did it. And in fact, they they delay their threats until the peak of the crisis had passed, and they pretty much knew that they wouldn't have to uh, make good on it. Putin has made that thesis completely irrelevant because he's intervened in Syria and Venezuela and you know, Africa and all sorts of different uh, uh, places that the Soviet leadership never would have gone into because of their fear of escalation and so forth. So he's a huge risk taker. The Chinese are not. Um, they have a long term view that, you know, they can afford to wait. Uh, however, you know, they have said pretty clearly that they do want to reincorporate Taiwan and that they'll do it, you know, by military means if that proves necessary. And I sus many people suspect that uh, Xi Jinping wants to accomplish this before he steps down from, you know, well, we don't know when he's going to step down, but, uh, uh, you know, he's not going to be there forever. Uh, you know, obviously, if you are a Chinese observer uh, of what's going on in Ukraine, you would be quite dismayed because this ally of yours has really screwed up. Uh, and you know, it's not good to be associated with that kind of failure. Uh, and, you know, they have to worry about the possibility of secondary sanctions hitting them if they seem to be too supportive of, uh, you know, Russia in terms of buying their exports and substituting their themselves for uh, Western uh, customers and the like. I would think that they'd also have to wonder about the performance of their own military. You know, it turns out that the Russians have not been good at, you know, they spent billions and billions of dollars modernizing their military, buying all of these fancy new high tech systems, and they still couldn't coordinate, you know, for example, their air power uh, very effectively, which is one of the reasons they've done so poorly in the war. And, you know, I would think that if you're a Chinese planner, you'd also have to be wondering how well your military is going to do. They, haven't fought a, a war since their attack on Vietnam back in whenever it was 79 or so. Um, so, you know, that would be a further reason, I think, for, uh, for caution. Yeah. But, you know, they have not broken openly with, China, uh, with Russia. Uh, they continue to, you know, support uh, rhetorically the Russian position. Uh, and so I think that at this point, you know, they're still allies and they will still uh, continue to be part of this authoritarian international, uh, you know, network that um, 
that the two countries have been uh, participating in. Hmm. And what about Taiwan? I mean, there's surely a lot of lessons for them in terms of what Ukraine has managed to do, which has been quite remarkable. Yeah, so Taiwan is a very different society. Uh, you know, Ukraine, in a sense, was prepared for this invasion because it started in 2014, and they've been fighting a war with Russia ever since then, and they've lost something like 14,000, you know, people in that in that conflict. And so they're used to having conscription. Uh, they're, you know, used to fighting. Uh, and you know they've responded, I think, magnificently to this threat to their uh, to their sovereignty. Uh, Taiwan has kind of moved in the opposite direction. They abolished conscription a few years ago. I think that there's been a general perception among, especially many younger Taiwanese, that you know it's kind of hopeless to fight China. Uh, we'll leave that to the Americans. And you know it's not clear that you would get this same kind of uh, immediate response, you know, to to defend the country. Uh, however, that's changing. Uh, so, a number of you know my friends in Taiwan have said that you know the Ukrainian war has been a wake up call uh, to the fact that they really do need to get much more serious about defense. There's a big kind of dispute going on now between the U.S. and Taiwan as to what kind of weapons are the most appropriate, uh, and I think that. You know, part of the problem was that nobody in Taiwan could actually take seriously the prospect that China would actually invade them. And I think that's still the case, that they, they just don't believe that that's going to happen. Uh, the Russian invasion, you know, I think was important in shattering some of that complacency because it shows that great powers still can do things like this. But um, uh, whether that leads to a real shift in you know, Taiwan's own behavior and defense policy, we'll still have to see. Hmm. Hmm. Let me turn to South Africa, where I often hear two different arguments about the, the, the war. Uh, the first one, which you've sort of dealt with, but let me just state it. So some people in South Africa say that NATO, the West and Ukraine provoked Russia into this war and must bear some responsibility for the Russian invasion. The, as you mentioned, there's some Americans, I think Henry Kissinger and John Mearsham have said something similar. What is your view of this? You mentioned earlier that yeah. you thought this was, un, you know, was, but what is your No, view? I mean, I, I think, yeah, that argument about NATO expansion has been there right from the, right from the start. I think that if you listen carefully to what Putin and the Russians themselves have been saying, you see that that's really not what's the issue. Because Putin has made very clear that, you know, it's just it's just the fundamental independence of Ukraine that's that's really bothering him, uh, and the fact that it's it really should be part of Russia. It was wrongly taken away from Russia in 1991, and that he uh, that he wants to fix that and. You know the complaints about NATO expansion. You know they they obviously were really pissed off by that and they didn't like it. But uh, I do think that that's just become an excuse. And even if you felt that NATO expansion was a threat, um, you know, does it make sense to actually launch a major invasion of a country of you know over forty million people as as the appropriate remedy for that? I I don't think so. Um, you could have gotten all sorts of deals before the war, you know, to, um, you know, pretty much, uh, well, I mean, the, the threat really wasn't much to begin with because nobody since 2008 had made any moves in the direction of, of uh, including Ukraine and NATO, and there was no interest really among NATO members to do that. So I, I do think that that was an excuse and not really uh, a source of fundamental motivation. Hmm. Hmm. The second argument I sometimes hear in, in this country is, is a different question. And it goes like this. Why does the world care more about this war in Europe and much less about other wars in Africa and other parts of the world? Is this racism? Or is it that the risks of this war and the global implications of this war are much greater? 
How, do, how would you respond to this? Well, I, I would have a two part uh, response to it. The first is that the, the moral stakes in the Ukraine invasion are much clearer than in other kinds of conflicts. Uh, you know, where you had a peaceful democracy that was not threatening its neighbor and then is subject to a massive, you know, military aggression across a, 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 a universally recognized international frontier. Um, many of the conflicts in Africa have not been of that sort. I mean, Nigeria didn't get up one day and decide to take over, you know, Benin and Togo and, you know, a bunch of its neighbors. Uh, I mean, that's really the equivalent, you know, act uh, that that would have taken place. A lot of Africa's conflicts have been civil wars. And so the, you know, like the conflict in the DRC, uh, which was incredibly bloody and, you know, I think was wrongly ignored by a lot of the outside world was an extremely in complex, you know, internal uh, civil war that, you know, where the rights and wrongs were, you know, much less uh, clear in certain ways. Now, there have been conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa that do have the same degree of moral clarity as the one in Ukraine. I would say the Uganda, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, Rwandan genocide uh, back in the early 90s was one of them. And I think uh, it was a huge moral failure on the part of the West not to have uh, intervened. Uh, it, you know, by the time it happened, it was probably too late to have an intervention. Uh, you know, they really need to have paid much more attention uh, ahead of time because people that were observing, you know, what had happened uh, in that country leading up to the massacre, you know, should have known that it would take, you know, substantial intervention, peacekeeping force. And, you know, the Western world and the Security UN Security Council in general simply weren't willing to support that kind of intervention, and so that that was wrong. You know that was morally wrong uh, not to do that. Uh, so I think those are the two mm. reasons. I, I do think that the West, you know, does need to pay more attention to conflicts in uh, uh, in other parts of the world. But I do think that the the grossness of the Russian action is really quite extraordinary. And I don't think it has a lot of counterparts in other parts of the world. Well, that takes us to the United Nations. Um, there are two parts here. The one is you've said that the Russian invasion shows the uselessness of the Security Council. And so that's my first sort of question to you. And then, in the General Assembly, with the vote about Russia's invasion, were you surprised at the large number of countries, some democracies in the developing world that, that abstained? Um, how do you see all of that? Well, the, the Security Council is not a surprise. I mean, the permanent members of the Security Council are these great powers that themselves have a lot of differences. And so it's you know, and if you give all of them a veto, of course, the Security Council yeah. is never going to act in any conflict that involves, you know, uh, uh, those the P5 uh, themselves. Uh, and that's just been a long standing problem with the Security Council. I don't think it's fixable. So I'm not surprised that they didn't act in uh, in this particular case. Uh, it was uh, perhaps not surprising. It was disappointing, but not surprising that um, some of the democracies in uh, the United Nations that were not part of the Security Council uh, didn't take a stronger stand. I would say South Africa is one of those countries and India is another. Um, you know, I, I think that there are various reasons uh, why this is the case. Uh, I think that, you know, kind of global defense of democracy has never been as important, you know, in, in the um, national identity of, uh, you know, other democracies around the world as it is in, you know, certainly in the United States or in uh, parts of Europe and their economic interests that uh, overrode, you know, the, um, uh, the interest in defending a, a principle. But I do think it's disappointing that, you know, there wasn't a greater recognition that, um, uh, that this was a, a you know a very bad thing that the Russians were doing. 
I would point to the statement that was made in the uh, UN right at the start of the war by the Kenyan uh, representative, which is really terrific. I mean, he said, look, you know, we in Africa have uh, co-ethnics that live across international boundaries. And if we decided that in order to correct that, we were going to launch invasions of our neighbors, then there'd never be any peace in, uh, in Africa. And I think, you know, that's another reason, quite apart from democracy, why uh, countries around the world really have an interest in opposing this Russian action, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's absolutely true that if you, uh, if you allow people to, countries to violate uh, other people's sovereignty in this way, uh, you won't have a very peaceful world. By the way, I know that this immediately will bring the reaction, well, what about the U.S. invasion of Iraq? And, uh, you know, that's right. I think that that was a huge mistake in American foreign policy. Uh, it should not have happened, and it unfortunately, uh, you know, set a precedent for a great power invading a, you know, a smaller country that I think we're going to regret, you know, for some time to come. Hmm. Well, Frank, we're nearly at the end. I've kept you talking almost solidly for an hour. Thank you very much indeed. I should tell the audience that Frank has just released a new book called Liberalism and Its Discontents. It's available in South African bookstores. It's a short book and a very elegant and brilliant statement of some important ideas. And I would strongly recommend it to everybody. In the last few minutes, Frank, unless you're exhausted, would you like to just say something about the new book? Um, sure. So uh, the book is a defense of classical liberalism. Uh, by which I mean a system devoted to the defense of individual rights uh, that limits government power uh, over individuals through a rule of law. Uh, it's not necessarily connected to a particular economic model. You know, in the United States, it's the word liberalism is associated with left of center politics and right. In, in, in Europe, it's associated with kind of center right politics. But I think that in fact, uh, it applies to a fairly broad range of countries that do have uh, strong judicial systems, constitutions that limit uh, uh, and put checks on executive authority. Uh, and, you know, it's closely related to other important um, uh, phenomena like modern natural science, the belief that we can manipulate nature by understanding, you know, the objective world outside of our subjective consciousnesses. And it's been under attack uh, from both the right and the left in recent years. And the book is really trying to remind people why it's better to live in a liberal society rather than in a closed one. Uh, and, you know, that's the, that's the argument. I tried to make it in as short a period and you know, as clearly as possible. Oh, great. And that's in some ways what the Ukrainians are fighting for at the moment. Um, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Frank, thank you very much. This has been absolutely fascinating. And we really appreciate you giving us time for CDE and for South Africans to, to hear you this afternoon. Thank you okay. very much and I wish you well. Thanks very much for having me, Anne. Great. Good. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks everybody. This, this conversation is now over. Thanks for joining us.